The working set was, uh, it was not without its tension, um, but in part it's because of the culture clash. Uh, uh, and you had a, a young, dynamic American director who knew exactly what he wanted and could get what he wanted if there were a hundred of him, he could get exactly what he wanted. Uh, and I think that probably had an effect uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, um, the tension level on the set. Um, because a lot of these people, uh, you know, on the crew, they weren't invested in Jim's vision in the way that we were. Um, so, you know, who can blame them for sort of just treating it like it's another job? I, I think the rudest thing I ever heard was the British calling, uh, referring to Jim Cameron as Grizzly Adams, because at that time he had a beard. And, and I heard him say stuff like that, and, and I thought, there's something wrong here. And the truth of it was that here you have this sweet-looking Gail Hurd come in, you know, who looks like a pixie, you know, and she's, and Jim, and they're coming in to make this huge movie on the, on the heels of Ridley Scott's success with Alien. And I think they kind of resented it. The British crew, who were excellent, but they, they were big Ridley fans, and I think it was very tough for Jim, because I, I don't think they'd seen Terminator. And he kept trying to have showings, and none of them would go. And so I think that it took them a while to realize how brilliant he was. And, um, and he's Canadian, you know? <laughs> um, but <clears throat> I think that was difficult, too. The whole movie was um, an experience that we didn't think would be as good as the initial aliens to start with. They were a bit off their pins, as they would say, but having a, having a woman producer. The English were then, by then, quite used to having a woman producer. So certainly no problem about her, about her being a woman. You know, her personality wasn't everybody's favorite. You know, from the crew, neither was Jim's. Actually, they, you know, there was a lot of tension between the British crew and Jim. It was a uh, a little clash here and there between Jim and certain other crew members. Most notably, probably between Jim and his first AG, Derek Cracknell. Some guy kept saying to me, um, actually, I think it was the, it was the first AD. I mean, he kept, you know, he kept calling me love and sweetheart. Pick the stool up, love. You know, but after a while, I said, you know, you got to stop. You know, I told Jim to stop saying that to me because it's so inappropriate for the character, and you know, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't really good, so. First time I walked on the set, I told you the story. The uh, the AD put his hand on my chest, and 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 nobody ever touched me like that. You know, like you know, stopping me. And I, I'm being from New York. I said to him, um, "You ever touch me again, I'm gonna kick your ass." And the next thing he did was say, "All right, bring in the artiste." And I said, "Man, you really are a wise guy," because I thought he was like putting us down, and I didn't realize the British call people artistes. And I said, it, 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 even though we speak the same language, it's a different language. I mean, he's, they're different than us. Uh, they invented the language, but boy, you know. I know Jim clashed with them. Um, Just because of tea time, though. It came at the, all the wrong moments, that's all. Right before an explosion, generally. We'd be getting ready to shoot. It was about 9.30. The stage door, which is, everyone's probably seen these doors, this huge door would roll open. And uh, all our smoke would start pouring out, and we would go, what's going on? This is about the first time it happened. And this woman would come in with a little tea cart. <laughs> She'd have a big urn of hot water and, or tea, and, uh, and it was break time. And this is something that here in the U.S. We, d we didn't do at the time. It's probably changed now. But they would stop everything and have tea. And uh, I know Jim had some uh, concerns about that on the main unit set. I mean, Jim is a very, very uh, uh, passionate, hard-driving type of a guy. And he is, uh, even at that time, could be, you know, insensitive um, to people's needs if it got in the way of making the movie that he wanted to make. I'm afraid I wasn't around when this tea lady's uh, trolley was damaged or whatever happened to be allegedly damaged. I used to help out the tea lady. I'd go over there and help her out, so it must have been on a day that I wasn't there. That's a union regulation in England, so, you know, you're going to have a tea break whether it's, whether you, whether you murdered the tea lady or not. There'd be somebody there the next day at the same time. <laughs>
we were used to having um, no breakfast. Everybody would turn up in the morning, they'd start work at 10 o'clock. Somebody would arrive with a trolley with some tea and a few grotty cheese rolls on it. Um, it would be there for 15 minutes and then it would go. So when it turned up, everybody wanted to go and get their cup of tea and roll. You would suddenly find an exodus of people going to grab this food because if you didn't get there first, there was no food left. And it's a long day with no food. So the problem is that that, I think, caused him some grief. If you've got that supplied to you all day long, it's not quite so important to go and get a cup of tea and a cheese roll because it's only there for 15 minutes. So I think the whole English tea thing has been blown out of all perspective. Look, first of all, the stagecraft and, and, the, and the craftsmanship in general uh, that the English did for this movie was, was second to none. I mean, these guys are, are great craftsmen and they, and they take their work seriously. And, uh, but I think the pace of the way the work is done is much more laid back. I mean, there's, there's a tea break at 10 o'clock and then there's a long lunch and most of the crew end up going to the pub that's actually, can you imagine a studio lot here with a bar? Do they have those? I don't think so, uh, you know, and... and uh, and then you'd come back and then you'd shoot for a few hours and then you'd have a tea break at four and just was a very kind of laid back kind of traditional way of making a film. Nothing wrong with it, but, but this was, there was a tremendous time constraint and budget constraints to make this movie, you know, work. So Jim, you know, was pressed to just squeeze every, every moment he could to get another shot. They do a draw at the end of the week. Everybody puts in like, you know, five pound or something. And at the end of every week, uh, they draw out of a thing and whoever wins gets all the money. And so it's like, you know, you win three or 400 pounds or something like that. And I remember them doing that on a Friday and them wanting to do this draw at the end of the day. But it was like while they were working, you know, and Jim was pissed. He was, he was like, no man, we're working here, man. Fuck the draw, you know, we got to get this last shot we have to get, you know. And they came around and, and we're right in the middle of setting up a shot and they walk up to Jim and say, you're gonna put some money in for this. And Jim looked at the guy and the guy just wanted to crawl in a hole because he, he, Jim could not relate to what was going on. It was like they were having a party and Jim was at war to finish this movie. It was a war. Really, when you start a movie, when you're on a movie, it is a war. You, you've got, the train has left the station. It's not gonna stop till it ends and it's a war. At one point, I remember Jim and Gail coming on the set making an announcement saying, look, if you guys don't shape up, we're going to pull the movie and go somewhere else. And they're all laughing, going, well, where are you going to get another crew? He said, we're going to fire the whole crew. And we, you know, they weren't kidding. They really weren't kidding. The day I uh, turned up on the set, there was a, a practically a, stri uh, a strike and a riot all, all, all in one. And I remember the first AD telling me, uh, gee, you, p you picked a bad day to come and do your day's filming, we're all walking out. We fired the first assistant, and then the first assistant, and then there was a rebellion by the uh, actors and the crew to get him hired back, and they, I, was out of, I was unfortunately out of the town at the moment, and they hired him back. <laughs> I thought, well, this is, this is you know, that was kind of unfortunate in my opinion. There were lots of meetings on this film uh, about working conditions, because as I said, we were working on a very hard production Everybody who's making a film wants to work 24 hours a day. I mean, who's in charge? And unfortunately, that's not possible. And neither is it a good idea, you know, to work, you know, really, really long days. So directors tend not to, you know, get tired because I think in reality, there's a lot of adrenaline going on and we try and uh, help that situation. But sometimes I think the tempers flare and that's probably what happened. But clearly, all these meetings must have been resolved because the final end result is there on the screen. and. Uh, I don't recall any time when we weren't about to work. So, you know, I certainly don't remember ever having any days off. So it couldn't have proceeded to a full strike.